Hello and welcome to News Click. Yesterday, June the 17th, the former president of Egypt, Mohamed Morsi, died after collapsing in the courtroom during a hearing of a case on espionage against him. To talk more about this, we have with us Prabir Burghaz. Hello, Prabir. Prabir, so we know the story of Morsi. He was the first democratically elected president of Egypt in 2012. And in 2013, exactly one year after he took office, he was overthrown in a, a mass, mass protest which broke out in the country. And immediately after that, the military used that opportunity to come back to power again. So how do you see his legacy, in the, especially in the aftermath of yesterday's incident, during which he was in a case? You see, of course, uh, it's also true that how he has died, that is still not clear. Because was, he, was it possibly a case where he was poisoned? Was it a case that you say he died, really died because, well, you know, people do tend to die under certain circumstances. Those are still something that we will, we do not know and we may not, may never find out the way the, way the military government is, would be dealing with all of this. Uh, what you said is he was the first, shall we say, elected president uh, for a long time in an election which is relatively fair. I wouldn't call it a democratic elections or a democratically elected uh, president. Because in that election also, the point was that it was done at very quick notice. Mm -hmm. The political processes were still unfolding. And apart from the Muslim Brotherhood, there was no other organized political parties in the fray. And the ancient regime, as it were, which also puts up which put up its own candidate. So apart from that, all the other forces were really disorganized, coming together. And therefore, it was, shall we say, an uneven playing field in which the Muslim Brotherhood emerged as the, as the uh, dominant force, both at the level of the president, but also at the level of the parliament uh, assembly, whatever uh, that it was there. Now, the point when you talk about Mursi's legacy, now, it is also true that the leading candidates of the Muslim Brotherhood, Brotherhood were disqualified. So effectively, Mursi was not the best candidate for the Brotherhood, who got catapulted to the position of the president. And uh, with all uh, the things that were happening, one thing was clear, that Muslim Brotherhood, particularly Mursi, did not really handle, shall we say, the post-electoral scenario with any maturity. They decided, and this is something which is either institutional in the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, or it was more the Muslim presidency. Again, this is, an, this is something only the history will tell, but it's not germane to this discussion. Both of them decided that having won the election, they had total uh, shall we say mandate do anything they pleased they did not look at the fact that what is the percentage of votes they, they had they didn't look at the fact that what does democracy really mean democracy does not mean that whoever has won the election has a mandate to do anything that they want they really thought that they had the mandate to introduce sharia they had the mandate to islamize society a lot of those measures which needed uh, shall we say a much larger political sanction from the people, which was which had not been given to them. They had come in a position where military dictatorship was rejected by the people. And that was what the Tahrir Square mass upsurge was all about. And there that the, the assuming that that mandate was for a completely an Islamized society is something which I think was a huge miscalculation. Uh, and this is the reason why all sections, shall we say, uh, both those who had fought for the Tahrir Square uh, upsurge, had fought against the military regime, to those who had been in some sense dispossessed from the positions of power, including the military regime, all of them came together then against uh, Muslim Brotherhood, yeah. including the old, shall we say, Nasserite forces. Mm -hmm. All of this came together against uh, Muslim Brotherhood, and that paved the way for the uh, Sisi's uh, emergence and a military dictatorship to come back again with a kind of so called electoral mandate. So, all of this I think shows also that, you know, if we don't for a long number of years have a democratic uh, polity, institutions, shall we say, of even, I would say, electoral uh, democracy, I won't even call it 
democracy in, in, in totality. But basically electoral democracy means parties, politics of certain kinds, alliances of different kinds, right. give and take, all of it is something that happens in the kind of electoral democracies that we are talking about. And these kind of uh, changes uh, take time, they don't happen overnight. And therefore people who come into this uh, scenario in, in a long, from a long period of military dictatorship, and we saw that in Pakistan as well, that they then come into it unprepared for the kind of concessions they have to make with each other so that they don't get the old military dictatorship come back. Right. And I think that's where uh, Mursi and his, uh, has his shall we say, his uh, cabinet, his, his party, uh, Muslim Brotherhood, all of them made very serious mistakes. Not that they're not mistakes on the other side, because the whole set of forces which combined with the military, military in fact, they appealed to the military to take over. Yeah. And having paved the way for a military takeover, now they're also in prison. They are also have no access to the levers of, shall we say, public opinion that for a brief period, about a couple of years, that was there in Egypt. And they're also paying, the, paying a very heavy price for that miscalculation. So it's not that the miscalculation didn't take place on both sides. Both the, shall we say, the progressive forces in Egypt the democratic forces in Egypt, and even the liberal forces in Egypt, all of them I actually, uh, in some sense, in their fight against the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, the appeal to the military to dis displace Mursi was a huge, shall we say, mistake. And that, that's what they are paying the price now as well. So Egypt is a tragedy that they were the ones who lit, some, in some sense, the fire of liberal, uh, shall we say, democracy in, uh, in, the, in the Arab world. And they are the ones who have invited military back. And that is also the place where the Muslim Brotherhood has come out in a way that shows that how sectarian they were and how they're unprepared to negotiate, shall we say, pluralist uh, electoral democracy. Forget about the deeper democracy which we need in the societies. And it's also interesting to maybe compare the case with Tunisia, for instance, where a different dynamic worked out. And although there have been a lot of tensions and unrest, nonetheless, a space was created and is still available for democratic forces to continue that kind of struggle, even though the Muslim Brotherhood is also active there. Well, again, it's interesting that, you make that you're making that comparison because Nahada and Nahada is essentially Muslim Brotherhood. So it's not a different formation. I think Tunis both the uh, forces which were f in favor of liberal democracy, including a section of the left, we have the Workers' Party led uh, an alliance of left parties which are there. Both of these sections uh, behaved differently with respect to the kind of electoral democracy that emerged in Tunis. Nahada did not do what Mursi did did not do what Muslim Brotherhood did in uh, Egypt. They did not try and shove Sharia down everybody's throat. They did not ask for changes to be made of different kinds. Yes, of course, they were also pushing, but they also knew that they had limits they could push. And if that endangered the coalition, which had brought all of them uh, into the electoral arena and had in some sense displace the kind of dictatorial regime that was existing under Ben Ali. So that they were aware of that there is an ancient regime way, waiting in the wings right. and anything that leads to a fracturing of the, shall we say, the larger uh, space would lead to them coming back. Right. So both sides did not make the kind of mistakes that was made in Egypt. Even today, these debates are going on in Tunisia that should we all combine to keep out completely the Islamist forces, should we not do that and have allow the Islamist forces also to have some space and keep out only the Wahhabi, Wahhabists right. who are in, in fact in open insurgency. Uh, that should we do that? Those are still the debates in Tunisia and I'm not going to 
uh, hold a crystal ball and predict what's going to happen there. But nevertheless, they seem to have behaved with a much greater degree of maturity. What they haven't done is ask the ancient regime to intervene against each other, right. which unfortunately is what uh, the forces in Egypt did. Right. And neither has Nahada gone to the sectarian uh, li limit. Of course, they, are, they do represent a certain kind of politics, but they have been also restrained to the degree that they have pressed this politics. And they have accepted there has to be uh, a degree of give and take within this, this kind of liberal democratic framework that winning an election does not mean a mandate to do anything that you want, which is how uh, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt seem to have taken the mandate. And therefore, that has, at least for now, has turned out much, much better. Yeah. That you still have a functioning liberal democracy in uh, Tunis, yeah. unlike what has happened in Egypt, in where you know uh, Mursi was overthrown. It was a bloody coup that the military did with the sanction of a large section of the people, and a large number of people got killed. Uh, there were massacres in different places and also a large number of the Muslim Brotherhood being thrown into jail. And this is created a temporarily a stable military dictatorship, but it is in the long term not a stable configuration. Uh, compared to that, the give and take in Tunisia seems to have actually uh, has gone much better. As I said, uh, fingers crossed how long that uh, persists and how long the forces on both sides negotiate the space that is opened up and not turn against each other to the extent that finally the, the military or civil forces step in. And of course, as we know, in all these countries, we have, uh, shall we say, the big brother, the NATO, the United States, uh, watching over the shoulders. And at any point of time, they can overthrow, have a regime change operation, right. and they are much more comfortable working with the military. Right. And we saw that in Sisi. The minute Sisi emerged, all this so-called pretensions of supporting democracy was forgotten. Right. And uh, you had the United States welcoming it, and of course Saudi Arabia, who is also very anti-Muslim Brotherhood because they see it as something which can destabilize the monarchies in the region. And they, of course, openly endorsing Muslim. The other interesting point is United States, United States seems to have an A-team, B-team in these games. They have the A-team is essentially the monarchies, right. okay, or the military dictatorships. And the B team is Muslim Brotherhood because I think that if we take it 15, 20, 30 years uh, time frame, then monarchies and military dictatorships may not last forever. Right. In which case for them, the next best option is not this, uh, shall we say, the uh, untamed wild of democracy, but the Muslim Brotherhood, right. which is definitely, if nothing else, will be anti left anti-progressive right. and would then will combine Sharia with a find of uh, also comfortable with uh, capital. So this is where you know this A team B team in the West right. uh, lies. But if, of course for the Saudis there is only one team. <laughs> so the axis that is being drawn by many analysts of say the monarchies and Egypt on one hand and the more pro-Muslim Brotherhood forces that would include Turkey, uh, Qatar for that matter and even forces now emerging in Sudan so you're you would not entirely buy that dichotomy that that is being constructed right now. well I would say that things are complex and we I, I think you we cannot really generalize completely mm. so as we saw Tunis is not like Egypt right. and Egypt is not like Tunis Sudan is not like Egypt or Tunis either right. so each of them have their own uh, regional specific dynamics as well, mm -hmm. country dynamics as well. And of course, oil always plays a major role in a lot of these issues. But one thing is very clear, the long-term alliance of a Muslim Brotherhood with the monarchies is broken down. Mm -hmm. And Muslim Brotherhood sees that while it wants a conservative Islamic society to emerge, but it wants to have that emerge without the monarchies because they think it is possible to have a popular consent for what they're doing. And Erdogan probably represents the most successful variant of the Muslim Brotherhood in that region. There's no, uh, there's no reason uh, to disbelieve 
uh, that this is something that cannot be done in even countries where there is a monarchy. Yes. That Saudi Arabia could be something which could also emerge like that. And let's face it, how long do we think, do we think we'll have monarchies of the kind which is Saudi Arabia continue uh, in the 21st century is open to question. And let's also be very clear, Saudi Arabia, Arabia is not a nation in the, the conventional sense we call nation. Saudi Arabia does not appeal to Saudi nationalism. It's a kingdom. So therefore, what is primary over there is the king. And what is secondary over there is a religious, shall we say, uh, order. And these are the two which have hereditarily have held Saudi Arabia for the last uh, uh, 60, 70, 80 years. So you have the uh, descendant of al Wahhab with the descendant of al Saud, who both of them hold the, one is the, uh, shall we say, the religious uh, leader uh, by birth, and one is the, uh, the Temporal, temporal leader by birth again. So these are the kind of scenarios which I think also uh, countries like the United States think is not for the long run. So therefore Muslim Brotherhood is there, their, their, shall we say, substitute if the monarchies fail. As long as the monarchies are there, they will of course play ball with it. And they will be their favorite players because much easier to play with one or two people instead of parties and movements. But Qatar is again a, a little bit of an outlier in this because you have the Emir of Qatar, the hereditary ruler, who has thrown in his lot with the Muslim Brotherhood. Thank you very much. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching news clip.